All right, so the title of this talk being uh, Exploring the Hidden Potential of Sound Data, I thought I would start by playing a little short um, audio snippet. So I'm not going to tell you what it is, so it might feel a little bit uh, random, that's a bit the purpose. What I want you to uh, notice is what it makes you think about. So let's get started. Okay. All right, so um, as I said, it's a little bit random. It's kind of like, uh, it's the sound of cutlery. I mean, I hope that you all recognize that. Uh, but it's kind of like, it feels very out of context. Why am I playing a sound of cutlery at a JavaScript conference? Makes absolutely no sense. But the notion of context here is very important. Because in general, you would expect to hear that sound maybe if you're at a restaurant or if you're at home, and you hear that sound because you're either eating or cooking, and maybe even more than that, depending on the time of the day, uh, it might be one of three meals, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And so without realizing, we actually attach a lot of contextual information to that sound of cutlery. All of a sudden, we think about a location, then we think about an activity, and maybe even a sub-activity. And uh, this is what we're going to talk about today. Not, not cutlery, but acoustic activity recognition uh, in JavaScript. And uh, before we dive a bit deeper, my name is Charlie Gerard. I'm a front-end developer. And outside of that, I'm also a Google developer expert in web technologies and a Mozilla tech speaker. If you have any questions about what these two tech communities are, feel free to ask me afterwards. But let's go back into the topic of acoustic activity recognition. What even is that? So it's using the rich properties of sound to gain insights about an activity or an environment. So this talk is highly inspired by a research paper that I read on the same topic by the Carnegie Mellon University in the, in the US. And uh, I really encourage you to read the paper a bit uh, later on. It's not too complicated to understand, and it's really uh, interesting. And what it tells us is that we could really build a lot more interesting uh, smart systems if we took advantage of sound data. Um, when we look at, like, to gather sound data, we need microphones. And there's built-in microphones in devices all around us. In the phone that you have with you at all times, in your laptop, in, uh, if you have a Google Home or an Alexa. So these devices uh, kind of trigger stuff based on words. So you kind of send them a comment and they do something. But it's not really that smart. They don't really leverage the properties uh, of sound. Uh, your phone doesn't know if you're in the bathroom uh, in the shower, and your Alexa doesn't know if you're in the kitchen. However, they could have that understanding of the environment. So how would you do that? Um, so if you look at the Web Audio API, you can have data uh, on the, from the microphone. So as input, it can take the microphone. And as an output, it gives you uh, arrays of numbers that represents the audio data. Uh, and usually, but usually when you read that from the, from the console, it makes it a bit difficult to understand, to gain any insights about this data. All you see is a lot of numbers coming out frequently per second, and it doesn't make any sense. The way to start to make a bit more sense out of this data is with visualizations. And the first one would be uh, the waveform. That's the white line that you see at the top there. And it kind of represents the sound wave displacement, displacement over time. So sound being the vibration of air molecules, this graph shows the oscillation of a sound wave. But looking at it, it you can't really know if maybe you're, you're speaking or clapping your hands, or like it doesn't quite make sense. Another way to represent sound is in the colored one, which is the frequency bar graph. So a frequency is a measure of how many times a waveform repeats in a, in a given time. Uh, but again, you might start to get some kind of insight of the, out of this data. Maybe you kind of understand that there's a beat, so maybe there's some music, uh, but that's it. But another way to gain a lot more insights by representing the sound in a visualization is a spectrogram. So a spectrogram is kind of like a picture of sound. Uh, it represents the spectrum of frequencies of a signal as it varies over time. You can think of it a bit as a, as, a, as a heat map of sound. In this particular uh, little uh, GIF here, the first part I'm speaking, and you can see that the, um, the visualization of me speaking is very different from when I'm clapping afterwards. And uh, I don't know if you can actually, so you can see a little bit, there's this really slight repeated pattern before I was speaking. And while I was actually uh, creating that little demo, there was a bird outside my window. And I didn't really quite think about it. I could just hear the bird. But then when I launched that demo in my browser, I could actually see the representation of the bird call or the bird singing in, uh, in my spectrogram. 
which I thought is, it was really cool because you actually have researchers using spectrograms to identify birds based on, uh, on the sound that they make and visualizing that with spectrogram. Um, so with the spectrogram here, uh, you have the x-axis, which is the time, so from left to right, how uh, sound changes and the frequencies changes over time. And here on the, on the y-axis, the frequencies from low to high. There's a third also a dimension, which is the amplitude. Uh, the louder the sound is going to be, the brighter the color. So as you can see here, you can visually see that there, you could identify some kind of pattern. There is a clear difference between the uh, representation of the frequencies when I'm speaking and the one when I'm clapping. Uh, and to actually gain insights with the data, instead of just doing it visually, you could do that with machine learning. So you could use TensorFlow.js. If you've never used uh, that before, it's basically the JavaScript version of the TensorFlow framework by Google that allows you to do machine learning stuff in, uh, in JavaScript in the browser or in Node.js. So, and to make it even easier, we're going to use the Teachable Machine Experiment by Google, where you can start by recording some background noise. And then you create, uh, you record some other sound samples. Here, I was snapping my finger, like that, next to the microphone. Uh, and you record it a few times. Uh, you record, I think, eight uh, audio samples minimum. Then you train your model to recognize the difference between me snapping my fingers and a background noise. And in the end, on the right, you have the preview of live data. So uh, live data coming from the microphone again, but it's data that the model has never actually seen before. The way I snap my finger once might not be the, way, the same way that I will do it later. Um, and uh, as Sarah was mentioning yesterday, uh, it's kind of that kind of interface that abstracts the complexity of machine learning so that you can just tinker with it and learn a lot more about it just by playing with an interface that just allows you to record samples and train a model. But you might be wondering, how does it actually work in the background? So I won't have the time to go into the code of, uh, of how to actually train that thing in the background without having to use that interface. But I think uh, it's important to go through the steps of, of how it could be done if you wanted to do that yourself. So if we go back to the data that we get in the console, so when you, uh, when you just want to, con to console log the frequency coming from the sound of, uh, or from the microphone, you get that in, uh, in the console. But uh, TensorFlow.js doesn't work with only arrays that you get like that. You have to transform the data. So the first step would be to collect that data. Don't worry about the numbers. It's just uh, you know, sample numbers. It doesn't, it's not really a thing. But you get that data from, uh, from the console. And that would be, but as you record over two seconds, you kind of get all of that data for two seconds. But TensorFlow doesn't really work with arrays like that. Uh, you have to label it, because as you're going to record a few different samples, you need to know what this data uh, matches to. So you transform that into arrays of objects with a label, which was going to be what you're recording, so snapping or background noise. And then the features is going to be all of the data that you collect from the microphone in an array. But then again, TensorFlow doesn't really work with objects, so you have to um, start kind of like transforming it into uh, multidimensional arrays. One multidimensional array with all the labels, so a snapping or speaking or coughing or whatever and another multidimensional array for all the features. So it's kind of like mapped um, to, to the features in, uh, in the features array. Uh, and that looks a bit closely, that's, more, that's closer to what TensorFlow can work with, because all of a sudden, it's just arrays of arrays. But the real data structure that TensorFlow works with is tensors. And that's the only moment where you actually start using TensorFlow there. Because before the transformation of the data, you can do it with normal JavaScript, with just pushing in arrays and objects and things like that. Once your data is ready, then you will pick an algorithm. And depending on the type of data and what you want to um, predict, then you will pick different types of algorithms. For example, if you want to work with images, you will use a convolutional neural network. And depending on what you want to do, you might look into other algorithms. And once your data is transformed and you pick your algorithm, you end up with a model at the end that is ready to make predictions out of new data it's never seen before. So in terms, once you've actually uh, downloaded your model from the Teachable Machine interface, uh, the way you're going to use it in your code, you uh, import TensorFlow.js. And the second, second thing that you can do is to import the speech comments model. So this particular model was actually optimized to recognize spoken words. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, um, to use other type of sounds. So I still use that model because, because it's the only open source model to uh, play with uh, audio data that I know of. But hopefully, in the future, Google is going to open source a bit more uh, models that can be optimized to recognize other things than just words. But for now, this is what we have to work with. Uh, then you have to create uh, an async function where you indicate the path to your model JSON file and your metadata.json file, so uh, the output of your training from Teachable Machine. Uh, then you can call some of uh, TensorFlow built-in method where you're going to instantiate, uh, you're going to load the model to be able to be able to use it in the browser. 
Then you define a few parameters depending on what you want to do with the, with the training. So first of all, so for example, in this one, uh, the include spectrogram parameter, I turned it to true because I wanted to get the data to be able to build my spectrogram. And you have uh, another parameter, like for example, overlap factor that tells you how many times you're going to predict per second. Then you can call your listen method on the model. And when it thinks it has predicted something based on how it has been trained, uh, you have a callback where you get the score of the prediction. So then when you're actually calling that function, uh, if I want to train different labels of like clapping my hands, speaking, or background noise, I give the URL of the model to my function. And the callback of data is going to get back to me an array of floats between 0 and 1. And the closer to 1 will be the label of, uh, of the sound that it has predicted. So uh, then you can build your interface around that. So if, for example, speaking is 0 0.9, then it means that it's 90% uh, sure that the sound it's hearing right now is somebody speaking. So I thought that now that I told you how um, kind of like the steps and, and uh, how, what it involves, I thought that I would show you a little bit a live demo of something that I built. So if, hopefully it's going to work. Yes, OK. So I have just this little demo here where uh, it's going to scout. So it should be listening to, so it has data from the microphone. And as I am speaking, I think I'm going to have to reload because it should be predicting that I'm speaking. And well, OK, let me reload. OK, speaking. OK, so it was a bit slow for some reason. Uh, but as I'm speaking, uh, OK, so it's not 100% accurate because I didn't train it for that long. But if I stop speaking and I start coughing, <coughs> <coughs> yes, OK. <laughs> so uh, it recognized that there's a difference of pattern between me uh, coughing and me speaking. And if all of a sudden I start typing, no. All right. So, <laughs> so you didn't hear, but I was typing. Um, and I think so. I also trained, uh, for example, the, to recognize the, my ring phone. I mean, if I think. Uh, Yay! So it's phone ringing. You might not hear it because you're far, but uh, basically my phone is ringing and it's recognizing that, I, that it was ringing and now I'm speaking again. And there's another one that I trained, which is brushing my teeth. This is a brand new toothbrush. This is not my toothbrush. Uh, just in case there's nobody else, it's just brand new. So if I do it maybe close to my microphone, like... <laughs> Come on! <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Like... No! Wait, I, I, it, OK, wait, wait. No? Yeah, OK, it, it worked. <laughs> ah, wait. <laughs> Maybe I should have brought my toothbrush, because it worked better with it. But um, OK, like rule of the story, do not bring a new toothbrush. So. OK, so I'm going to exit my, uh, my demo. I had just like, a, little, uh, a little video in case it wasn't working. But what is interesting with this is that I recorded everything uh, at home. So it was a totally different environment. I wasn't speaking the, the same way. It doesn't recognize the words. It doesn't care about the words. Uh, but everything was, was trained and recorded in another environment. And it means that uh, if you go to that URL later, uh, you can actually try it, and it should, it should work for you uh, as well. So I trained it quite uh, quickly, so it's, not, it's never 100% accurate. Uh, but the more data you give it, the more samples, the more accurate it should be. Also, just as a note, uh, I built this demo very quickly, so it works really well on Chrome, but there's some, er uh, some issues with uh, Safari and Firefox. I just need to fix it if you give me some time. Uh, but yeah, so um, that, was, that was kind of like the, the purpose of the demo. Uh, I demoed it in the browser because it's easier for me to do it here uh, at .js. I just need to bring my computer. But you can actually also build your, your own little uh, IoT smart system at home with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and I put the, uh, the link to, uh, to the GitHub repository. This uh, GitHub repository is actually by the research center that I mentioned at the beginning. So it's in Python. But it would actually be interesting. I'm pretty sure that it can also be translated back to JavaScript. Um, so you can do that on, on the little device at home as well. So a few benefits. So for me, like in my opinion, and also based on what I researched, the main benefit is around having one sensor to rule them all, basically. So if you have, you might have actually some smart devices at home already. You might have a smart fridge or a smart coffee machine. But it's actually not that smart because your fridge doesn't know at all if your coffee machine is on. It doesn't know if your smart toaster is on. So they're actually not that smart. Whereas if you actually replaced that system, if you used one of your Google Home or Alexa to listen to the sound of the door of the fridge opening, or the coffee machine on, or even the tap water on, you could have one sensor to understand what is happening uh, around you. And it would be a lot, a lot cheaper and probably a lot more accurate and a lot more interesting. Once you uh, give it a few samples of audio data, you can, uh, you can work on the software to actually uh, create some, like a better interactive house, basically. 
Uh, in terms of applications, uh, that's, I'm going to mention three that I thought about, but I don't always have the best ideas, so uh, you can eventually like, come up with other ones. But in terms of smart home and smart office, a lot of the times we might have motion sensors in an office, but they often failed on me because if I'm on a call and I'm not moving, the light just turns off and it's just like, well, I'm here. Uh, whereas if you were using speakers, again, they're not listening to the words that you're saying, they're just trying to find patterns in, in the audio data that they get. So if you're speaking in a meeting, you're obviously in the room, so the light should be on. If you're typing, you're obviously in the room as well. In terms of smart home, you could automatically pause Netflix uh, if your phone starts ringing or if your doorbell starts ringing, because obviously, contextually, you're going to do something else if one of these activities happens. So you could mute or stop Netflix. If you like uh, cooking and watching uh, YouTube videos, they could actually stop automatically when they tell you to chop some carrots or whatever. They say, oh, I don't know, chop carrots, and they would be listening to the sound. And as soon as you're done, it would keep, uh, make the, the video keep going and things like that. Uh, another one is around interactive storytelling. And I find that quite interesting, especially if you're working in maybe uh, creative agencies or media. Um, you, you could actually create a lot more interactive and immersive content online that, that you could play, that like, would be quite playful for people to work with. Uh, I used to work very uh, briefly at a creative, as a creative developer at the New York Times in London, and I would have definitely used that kind of technology to make the content a lot more uh, interesting especially when you think about the way that we very often imitate, uh, I don't know, noise of like uh, animals or, or transportation, like a plane or a train. You could have stories that end up like, uh, and they live happily ever after, and to close the story, you have to imitate a car, like, bye, like, you could just use sound samples like that to actually interact with the story and allow people to really be part of it. And then uh, finally, in terms of health tracking, I showed an example of coughing, but um, you could be also sneezing or snoring, and you, can, uh, you could track some kind of health and remind people to maybe go to the doctor or things like that based only on sound data. So uh, very briefly, some limitations. Obviously, uh, there are, because it's quite prototypey at that time. But you need a lot of samples of data if you decide to do everything yourself. Um, this is why I use the Teachable Machine Experiment, because they, the model that they used was pre-trained. So I just, add, I just had to add uh, not that much you know, samples. But if you want to do everything yourself, you're going to have to record quite a lot. And the quality of the samples is important as well. Uh, the model file size can be quite large, so depending on the experience that you're building on the web, uh, you might have to do some prefetching, make sure that the user experience is not damaged by the size of the file. And then finally, uh, it's not always able to understand multiple activities at once. Uh, if, if, for example, um, I don't know, I'm watching Netflix in the shower, it would have to, at the moment, it would have to pick which activity it recognizes the most. It doesn't actually understand that there's two uh, things at once. But this is where there's uh, another type of technology that, it, uh, that ends up being very interesting that I will not have the time to really cover. That's you know, probably for later if I get the time to work on it. But it's general purpose synthetic sensors. So on the right, there's a microcontroller here that has a lot of sensors in it. So on top of just having a microphone, it also has an accelerometer, a temperature sensor, a motion sensor. And instead of building a spectrogram only out of uh, microphone data, it builds a spectrogram, a different one for all of these sensors, and try to combine all of that data to have even a better understanding uh, of the activities around it. So that, that would actually allow people to understand multiple activities at once. So I'm getting towards the end of that talk, and I know that some of you might be a bit skeptical, because kind of like, why would I use this, or things like that. But the person, the main researcher uh, on that project, actually, uh, is now working as, uh, as a machine learning researcher for Apple. And when you look at everywhere where he worked, he basically worked in all of the biggest companies. But what I mean is that if, he, if Apple is interested in that kind of technologies, I'm pretty sure that in the not so far future, it might be something that we have to work with. Uh, if Apple is looking at it, you can be sure that Google is looking at it, Microsoft, Amazon. And in a way, we're not waiting for any uh, hardware updates, because all of uh, your iPhone or my laptop they already have microphones. What we're probably waiting on is the right application to help uh, people. And this is exactly where we can help, especially now that you can prototype that kind of stuff in JavaScript. It means that you don't have to be a data scientist and you don't have to learn Python. You can actually find the right application uh, for that kind of stuff on the web and help this research actually uh, bring, like, like, you know, create real, uh, real applications that people can use instead of leaving that kind of tech being uh, just in research. Um, Basically, anyway, uh, on this, uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. I will share the links later on, uh, on Twitter with you know, all the resources if you're interested. Otherwise, uh, I will be around the rest of the day if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah.